Sit. You're in the mood now. You're in the mood, and why? Why do we have to be in the mood? Because guess what time it is now? It is EVA time. Yes, and you're probably wondering what is EVA. How many of you have you come across this in your valuation? Okay, let me give you a quick history of EVA. What happened back in the late 80s is Stern Stewart came up with this algorithm that they proprietarized and made it into a trademark and they called it EVA. So when you use EVA, you actually really you should have a little trademark logo on the top of the EVA, especially when you use informal documentation. That trademark has to be there all the time. Stern Stewart got that trademark. Stern Stewart is a is a consultancy out of, running out of New York, New York. And what they did was they got a lot of S&P 500 companies back in the late 80s and the early 90s to adopt EVA. And guess what? Guess when EVA works? It works very well when things are growing. And guess what happened during the 90s? Do we have lots of growth or contraction? We had lots of growth. When you were going to primary school, there was a lots of growth happening around the world. All right? And it ended up with the boom up to the 97, 98, and then up to the dot-com crash. 2000, another story. Things have been stagnating. And so all the way through the 90s, Stern Stewart would say, look, you need to adopt EVA. Why? Because all the companies that have, look what's happened in the last 10 years. Start of 90 and the EVA adoption companies, they seem to be growing much better than the ones that didn't adopt EVA. So therefore, you need to jump on our bandwagon and do the same. Unfortunately, academic research in this, this intervention has got mixed results. Has produced mixed results in terms of does EVA help an organisation or not? And especially during the last ten, the 10 years, 2000, 2010, there's no, not much difference between EVA adopting organisations and non-EVA adopting organisations, everything else being equal. And so it looked really good as an anom anomaly during the 1990s. But it's still around and you need to be aware of it because consultants are going to come knocking at your door when you're on the CEO one day. Put your hand up if you want to be a CEO one day. You want to be a CEO? <laughs> really? Huh? CEO? Okay, all right. CEO of the London office, I understand. All right, okay. All right. So, when you're a CEO one day, the consultant's going to come to you. Yes, do you want EVA? And you've got to think, well, hang on, there's some catch here. There's some catch behind something I don't fully understand. Because in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, there's not much difference between EVA and residual income. It's the same principle. That is, we're putting some kind of barrier there that you, you should not make an investment decision for the division unless it's earning above this certain threshold. If it's below, do not. If it's above, do. Simple. Black or white. Black and white. EVA does the same thing, but a little bit more modified. So basically, it's profit minus capital charge except for modification. What do we mean by capital charge? We mean this, we mean whack. Okay, weighted average cost of capital. You know that. You know that because you, you did corporate finance. You, you did, didn't you? I taught corporate finance for four years. Do you know what we used to do? We used to play, and students didn't always get it, or they think they could study half of it, and then they struggled during the semester. And so I, I talked to my colleague that I taught it with and said, look, give me the first half, and let's do, let me give them a pep talk at the beginning. So we've got 150 new students, all right? So I'll walk in. I'll walk in the corporate finance. Okay. Welcome to corporate finance. Corporate finance, financial management, business finance, different universities call the same thing, different thing, but you know what we're talking about. Welcome to corporate finance. This is a very hard unit. We fail students here. 
and a lot of you are going to fail the first test. It's a 30% test and it happens in week five, end of week five. Not midterm, week seven or eight, but we're talking about one third into the way of this course, it's going to be 30%. I want your full attention in classes. I want your full attendance. No excuse for non-attendance, except a funeral, your own. <laughs> this, is, this is the talk we used to, no seriously, this is the talk we used to give to the students, all right? And we used to, we used to freak them out in the first, the first four or five weeks. And then, I, then after that first pep talk, that first pep talk, I could get on to focus on, you know, uh, efficient frontier and weight average cost of capital and bond valuation, capital asset pricing model and all those things and all the students are going, you know, they're just worried about this 30% test where, you know, you either pass or fail. And, but it was just, you have, to, you have to teach and study corporate finance like that. It's like, it's either you get it or you don't. It's very hard to t understand three quarters of corporate finance. You really got to get it, all of it and understand it that way. So that's the way we taught it. That's the way I taught it. I taught it for four years. So love, I love corporate finance. So that's why I'm so excited to know that, okay, we get to chapter 10, they start talking about EVA and I'm thinking, EVA, it's got WAC in it. Well, I know all about WAC. I don't need to have EVA to have WAC in a residual income figure that I can make up for an organisation. EVA is this special proprietary thing where there's 164 different modifications that they say, they say these are modifications so the divisional managers don't play with the numbers. Remember what I said time and time again in the first hour was divisional managers will go and play with debt, you know, or they'll do leasing, or they'll do financing, or they'll change the assets, or change the income. They start playing with things once they know. They're gaming the system. One of the arguments by Stern Stewart is that we've got all these 164 mystery changes to stop this gamesmanship. And I don't even know what these 164 are, okay? I wouldn't even want to start to try and teach you that. But that's that's the spiel from the consultants. So here's the deal. Here's the deal for EVA. You know it's weighted average cost of capital. You know all about that. Let me ask you a question. Where does the cost of equity come from? What about Apple's balance sheet? Does it have debt or does it have equity? Hands up for debt. Hands up for equity. It has equity, it's on the share market, come on, that has equity on the balance sheet. Shareholders equity, does it have debt? It does have debt, and now it has bonds, you know, it sold 16 billion of them several months ago. Okay, so it didn't have to repatriate money from overseas uh, tax free. <laughs> without, if they brought money back in, they would have to pay tax on it, so it's cheaper for them to issue bonds. And that's what they did several months ago. So now they've got debt and equity on the balance sheet. So now you can do whack, whack on Apple's balance sheet. Okay, you can, you've got some debt, you've got the bond, you do the bond valuation, you've got the equity. And you've got the beta of Apple, which is less than one. Pretty good investment to invest in, right? The beta is less than one. Yes? Yeah. You don't want to do Facebook. The beta is over one. Okay, very going up and down all the time. All right, so... The cap, you can use a capital asset pricing model come out of equity. Now you can work out the whack for Apple. And now you can plug that in and use that as a residual income benchmark. You can do that. All right, two, two stories. Here we have, what is this? This is an aeroplane. Yeah, all in this pond, airline. Correct, correct. It's an aeroplane. All right. Yes, all right, thank you. Thank you for your participation, that's great. All right, so this is supposed to be the 787. This is the new Boeing. All right, now one day, all of you are going to be CEOs, I hope. Because when you're a CEO, then I'd like to work for you. I can be your driver or your assistant or something like that. That will be my retirement. So do, do promise me that when you're a CEO of a uh, S&P 500 or Boeing, okay? 
I'd love to come and fly. You can put me in economy class, it's fine, I'm okay. All right, I don't need business class. All right, so we got to Boeing, and one day you're a CEO of Boeing. It's okay, so the first day you come into the office, what do you do on your first day? Oh, call in Henry. Henry's in charge of production, production manager. Call Henry in. Henry, we've got to do something about our profitability. I want you to push down costs, do whatever you have to do to push down costs, get more efficiency, get more planes out and get them out cheaper. I know there's 3,000 parts in this plane, there's so many, there's a millions of things, 3 million parts in this plane, there's millions of things that you have to do, but I know you can do it. All right, then Michael, Michael comes in, Michael, Michael you're the sales manager of Boeing. I need you to grow revenues like a business development manager. I need you to grow revenues. I need you to get more orders. Please, I know there's three million factors impacting on your decisions, on the things you have to do to get what I want, but I know you can do it. Go Henry and Michael. Okay, so Henry goes back to his team. Team, we're under pressure from head office. We've got to cut costs. Someone puts in, I know how we can do it. We've got this new plastic fibre we can put on the plane. We can replace the metal and we can save lots of money. You know, they call, we can make our new 787 with this special plastic, no carbon fibre, right? Plastic, all right, plastic. Save lots of money. Yes, and Michael goes, yes, I know we can do it. That's uh, Henry. So now Michael goes to his team. Team, what have we got to do here? We've got to get more sales. We've got to get more top line. How do we get more top line growth? Someone puts a hand up. I know. Let's get cheaper financing. Great idea. Okay, any other ideas? Yes, there's this little country on the other side of the Pacific we know we can sell scores of jets to. What's that country? Oh, it's China. Yes, let's go do it. Let's go and sell to China. All right. So, anyway, so Michael and Henry, they come in. They come into the CEO six months later. Six months later and they're grinning, they're smiling because they know they have done it. They have done it, they have got the 787, they've got those costs cut. We have got that China business. We've got the orders. The orders are in the pipeline and they're smiling. You know why? Because it's bonus day and the CEO says, mm, you're the CEO, what are you going to tell them? Because you're doing EVA. I'm sorry Michael and Henry, um, it's going to take five more years for the actions that you have taken in the last six months to flow down into improvements in the EVA on which your bonus is attached to. I'm sorry, but can you come back in five years time? So if you were Michael or Henry, what are you going to do? What would you do? you would probably leave, okay, go to Airbus, okay? But here's the truth behind the story, okay? Dramatising a little bit, okay? Stern Stewart, the consultants, they did go to Boeing and tried to sell them on EVA. They did do that back in the 90s, early 90s. And Boeing said no. Boeing said no. I don't know why they said no, but obviously it was a smart choice, okay? And what they have now is an incentive system which is like a reversed engineered EVA. What do we mean? Is, okay, Michael Henry come in for their bonus. They compute, okay, what operational improvements have you made? Let's, let's forecast that in five years' time and then discount time value of money back to and calculate the bonus we should pay you today for the five-year benefits that the company will get from your actions today. And on the sales side, what have you got in the sales channel? Let's forecast that out and let's discount that back and then pay bonus. So that's what Boeing does. Okay, so it's kind of, EVP looks backwards, but they made it forward looking without having to pay Stern Stewart consultants any money. Okay, another, another true story. See this here? There was this company that owned, that run the locomotives in the US, and you're talking about three, four, five years ago there was this uh, runaway locomotive went across one or two states end up crashing somewhere. Okay. 
how do these things happen? Stop caring for safety, stop caring for training, okay, focusing on the bottom line. This company was using EVA. Yes. This company was using EVA. 2005, uh, Osaka, was it Osaka? There was a huge train crash in Osaka, in Japan. Japan Rail. Train was going too fast, went around the bend. <coughs> it came off. Injuries, deaths. Why was the driver travelling so fast? Their incentive system was tied to how much on time they are in getting from station to station. At that particular point where the train went off the rail, the, the driver was behind. The incentive system can cause bad things in the organisation. Class, so far this semester, we've talked about RAP and we've had fun with RAP, but the further you go up in the organisation, you need to know and be sensitive to the good things and the bad things that are associated with making people's incentives based on those results. There is no perfect measure for a results control. But you need to have results controls. So what I'm suggesting, what is the solution ladies and gentlemen? What is the solution? What should you do? You need to have a combination of measures. You need to have a combination of measures and strategically focused responsibility centres, which is what we're going to talk about from next week to the end of the semester.